How do you follow? We're on. You're on? You're not. Now I'm on. Now she's on. Very good. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, brother. All right. I'm going to get this out of the way. So I don't trip over it because I'm so graceful. How are y'all doing this morning? Did y'all have a happy Valentine's Day? I did. I had my Valentine, my sweetie, my honey dog. I was good to go. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is not returned to you void, but it accomplishes that thing which you sent it to do, changing hearts, minds, and spirits. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, today that we can uh, have a good time in your word today. Father, that we can enjoy it. Father, you gave us all a sense of humor uh, uh, just by the people that you made. We can tell that you have a sense of humor. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, that uh, we have a good time. But, Father, we also learned something through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, this morning, Pastor John uh, has asked Diane and I to be part of his continuing sermon series, Help Me, Holy Ghost. That series is focused on godly relationships. And godly relationships are incredibly important. Relationships between husbands and wives relationships between individuals dating one another, uh, and relationships at work, relationships between just people out there in the community, but finally and most important of all, our relationship between us and God. Uh, so relationships are incredibly important. After he asked us to do this, uh, we were at a loss <laughs> as to what specific area of relationship that we should address because we're equally bad at all of them. Um, yeah. Because over the last 43 years of marriage, our approach to relationship building has been one of intense trial and error. Intense. Intense. It's the key word. Very intense, with the greatest focus being on error. Yes, error. Probably more than you than me, right? I think I remember that. I certainly said so often enough. We have made a lot of mistakes in that time period. So we asked our kids. We, we put a poll out there because, you know, we said, you know, Pastor John has asked us to do this. What area of great strength in our marriage do you think we should talk about uh, in relationships? And uh, you'd be surprised. Our, our son provided an answer immediately. His answer became today's topic, and today's con topic is conflict resolution. And when he, uh, he said that, I said, son, why conflict resolution? Why do you think that would be the best topic? And his answer was a little bit offensive, actually. Uh, he said, you guys fought so much for so long, you eventually learned what not to do. So here we are. And he wasn't kidding. It, it, is, it is our great experience of conflict resolution that we're going to share with you today. And, uh, and so we did learn what not to do. Let me give you a couple of examples of our learning curve. Uh, I don't know how many of you out there have thrown dishes at one another. Uh, and I know it's hard for you to imagine this sweet woman throwing dishes. But in our third year of marriage, we found ourselves in a huge argument over, I have no idea what we were fighting about. Most of the time, I had no idea what we were fighting about. But we were in our house, and we were pretty poor. We didn't have a lot of money, and we got an argument. Our argument moved to the kitchen, and when we moved to the kitchen, uh, we were both standing next to the dish drain. No dishwasher then, standing next to the dish drain, which was full of clean dishes. And she began throwing dishes at me. And when she began throwing dishes at me, I responded and began throwing dishes right back at her. But in the middle sure of this, way to handle things. <laughs> we were very mature at that time. The, the funny part about it is, is we realized halfway through this dish throwing contest that we were searching through the dish drain for the Tupperware because we couldn't afford to buy new dishes. So we both started laughing in the middle of the argument because we realized we were pretty angry, but not so angry that we were willing to break dishes that we couldn't pay for. So we learned something that day. Don't tear stuff up that you have to pay for when you're angry. Well, if you know Bob and I, you realize we're both very passionate people. No. And so putting us together in a marriage, we questioned God, and we've been to a lot and let me repeat a lot of counseling and we went to this set of counselors one time and they said okay we're going to give you a tool when you get into an argument to use to help settle this argument because if you know Bob Bob is going to talk over you okay so I said okay we'll try this and they called it red light green light have any of you ever heard of this tool 
Okay. It well, works it's, great. It's, it's interesting. It works great. All right, so it's red light, green light. And what they said was, is a person is able to give their opinion and their say on this argument. And then the other person, when they wanted to say something, they say, red light. And that person was supposed to stop talking. Stop talking. There's key. Stop talking. It's very All hard right? for me. So, and then when you finished, you could say, green light, and then the other person can go. So, we're in the van one day. We're traveling down the highway, and we get into this argument. Which never happened. Bob is talking and talking and talking and talking. And finally, I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? All right. So I say, red light. Bob stops talking. I'm like, oh, this is going to work. So Good luck I that. start talking. I get three sentences in. And Bob goes, red light. And I went, okay, I'll follow the rules. So I got quiet. Bob starts talking and talking and talking. I say, red light. He stops. I get one sentence in. He says, no, red light. And then I blow. I'm like, no, you cannot do that to me. And so then we're talking at each other. Well, here's the interesting thing. We get down to the bottom of the hill of Holiday and Camp, that first light. Yes. And Bob is blind as a bat without his glasses. Yes. He cannot see. Yes. And he's just got contacts. Which I will never do again. He's just got contacts. Now remember, we've in this red light, green light. We're in this big argument. We get to the bottom and we're stopped. And his, this contact pops out. And he looks at me and he says, um, Honey, I need you to put my contact back in my eye. My thought was, I'll put that contact back in your eye. Okay? Now, that little method didn't work for us. So we went back to the counselors and we said, uh, that doesn't work for this couple. You have to understand that my philosophy is a football philosophy. If the offense is all on the field all the time, the other team doesn't get to score. So I just keep the offense on the field at all times, right? Just keep rolling. And I'm really glad I still don't have an eye patch on this side. <laughs> uh, the last example I want to give you before we uh, get deeper into the message and actually throw some scripture at you is uh, it sounds like a, uh, a spy thriller. It's called Code Word Lawnmower. Code Word Lawnmower. Uh, in many marriages, and it's a good idea, this is a good uh, method for you to use, is to have a code word. Uh, when you get to a point in an argument where you know neither one of you are going to agree and neither one of you are going to stop yelling at each other, you should have a code word. Let me give you an example of our code word. If you ever hear this code word, you know that we've reached an impasse, that we can't get along and we're not going to agree, which she's a stubborn, stubborn person, so agreeing with my intelligence many times is hard for her to do. So what had happened is we were one day, it was a Monday afternoon. It was the first Monday of the month. It was 12 noon. Does anybody know what happens? Wichita Falls, first Monday of the month at 12 noon. Tornado siren goes off. We had one in our backyard. Well, the, we're eating lunch. We were eating uh, pineapple cottage cheese, I believe, for lunch. I, I remember it well. It's like it was yesterday. My, my, by the way, my telling of the story is always the correct one. Don't believe her side. So we're sitting at the table, and, uh, and the siren goes off, and there's something wrong with the siren. The siren's broken, and it sounds terrible. It sounds awful. It sounds like some dying person. And I looked at her. I said, that tornado siren sounds sick. And she said, that's not a tornado siren. That is a lawnmower. I said, no, baby, that's, that's, that's a tornado siren. She said, no, 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 it's a lawnmower. I said, baby, it's, it's a tornado siren. And this is what she does. This is what she always does in arguments, which infuriates me. I don't know if it does to you. She said, you're right. Now, when she says it that way, I know she doesn't know I'm right. She doesn't mean I'm right. She doesn't think I'm right. She's just telling me that to shut me up. So I said, no, no, listen, it's a tornado siren. She said, no, baby, it's a lawnmower. So now every time we reach a point in an argument where we're not going to reach a, uh, we're at an impasse and can't get along, I'll look at her and I'll say, it's a tornado siren. And she'll smile and she'll say, it's a lawnmower. And we'll move on. It's a great way to argue. Amen. Amen. So today, we're going to share what we've learned through years of intense conflict, conflict and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, these are the six steps 
for resolving conflict in marriage. Start us up, baby. All right. Okay. You can also use them in other relationships as well. But there is no way to avoid conflict in your marriage. The question is, don't do that yet. I'm not. I'm waiting on you then. <laughs> the question is, how will you deal with it? There you go. First of all, what is conflict? According to Webster's online dictionary, conflict can be, one, a serious disagreement or argument, typically a protracted one, or to be incompatible at variance or clashing. Bob and I have clashed many times Even through the many years. Many times at variance, and all of our arguments are protracted. <laughs> Few couples like to admit it, but conflict is common to all marriages. Bob and I have had our share of conflict, and some of our disagreements have not <laughs> been pretty. Nor did they make sense. The first year we'd been married two weeks, I slammed the door so hard and told him to go live somewhere else that the pictures fell off the wall. And I was walking down the stairs. We were in a trailer, okay, a trailer, which now we live in a manufactured home. We've moved up in the world, all right? <laughs> well, we were in an actual trailer. It's a trailer. She slammed the door so hard, the pictures fell off the wall. I was walking out the door, walked down the stairs. The landlady was walking up the stairs, and you could hear what she said, me coming out the door. And the landlady looked at me, and she said, is everything okay? And I said, Sure. Why would you not think everything's okay? We do this all the time. Like I said, not pretty. <laughs> so we could write a book on what not to do. With illustrations. So you start with two selfish people with different backgrounds and personalities. Add some bad habits. Any of you have bad habits? Oh, nobody's admitting. Oh, one admitted it. Ask, <laughs> ask, ask their wives. Uh, bad Does habits. he have bad habits? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Interesting idiosyncrasies, throw in a bunch of expectations, turn up the heat a little with the daily trials of life, and guess what? You are bound to have conflict. It's just unavoidable, especially when you have two individuals that come from radically different backgrounds, which Bob and I did. And since every marriage has its tensions, it isn't a question of avoiding them, but how are you going to deal with them? Conflict can lead to a process that develops oneness where you're one, you're unified, or isolation. And I knew a couple that had been married for years, but they lived two very different separate lives. And Bob and I don't function that way. We like to annoy each other every day. <laughs> you and your spouse must choose how you will act when conflict occurs. So step one, resolving conflict requires knowing, accepting, and adjusting to your differences. One reason we have conflict in marriage is that opposites attract. Usually a task-oriented individual, which is me, marries someone who is more people-oriented, which is Bob. People who move through life at breakneck speed, Bob, seem to end up with spouses who are slower paced, which is me. Bob likes his life to the wall all the time. <laughs> and I'm always like, Bob, I'm tired, slow down. Okay? It's strange, but that's the part of the reason why you married who you did. Your spouse added a variety, a spice, and a difference to your life that it didn't have before. And Lord, did Bob add spice to my life. I'm spicy. You hear a lot about people that rock the boat. Bob didn't just rock the boat. He capsized the boat. He, rock okay? the boat. he rocked my world. But after being married for a while, sometimes a very short while, the attractions short become while. repellents. First year. That very thing that attracted you to that person becomes the very thing that annoys you. First day of the first year. First minute of the first day. Red light. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. She doesn't need any help. <laughs> you may argue over small irritations, such as how to properly squeeze a tube of toothpaste. There is no proper way. And we did. I grew up with a mother that was very precise. And when you used toothpaste, you rolled it up from the end to keep squeezing the toothpaste up, oh, and you yeah. always, always, always put the cap back on the toothpaste. Where's, where's the excitement in that? <laughs> okay, that's how I grew up. That, that's just how you did it. 
I marry a man, you squeeze it in the middle. Wherever you get a hold of it. You don't put the cap back on it. Definitely not. You throw it in the drawer on top of my hairbrush. Good work. Yes. Good work if you can get and it. And then I pick up the toothpaste and my hair is hanging off the toothpaste. And the problem was? And there was a war. Floss. Automatic so floss. My way, yeah. my way to end this war was I said, you get your own tube of toothpaste and don't you dare touch mine. And I'm moving my toothpaste over here and you stay over there. That was my way to end in that war, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you also will argue over philosophical differences in handling finances or raising children or where will you attend church or whether or not you speak in tongues. Or if you will attend church. You may find that your backgrounds and your personalities are so different that you wonder how and why God placed you together in the first place. And I ask that question many, many times. Every minute of every day. It's important to understand these differences and then to accept and to adjust to them. Just as Adam accepted God's gift of Eve, you are called to accept his gift to you. God gave you a spouse who completes you in ways you haven't even learned yet. And that's how it is between us. It's how it's been from day one. We were no exception. Perhaps the biggest adjustment we faced early in our marriage grew out of our differing backgrounds. Absolutely, like squeezing the toothpaste. You know, now I have an unsqueezable toothpaste. It's wonderful. Just open the cap. It works. Never a problem. Right? Now, listen, I came from a very dysfunctional family. I, I really hesitated on whether or not I should introduce Diana to them at all or tell her I was raised by wolves, which was pretty close to the truth. Or my parents were abducted by aliens. Not true, although they acted very much like somebody from another planet, which is what I learned. To be honest with you, right before we got married, I, while we were dating men, you can understand this. I know you can. I told her that I was a clean freak, that I washed my sheets every two days, that I washed, dried, and ironed my clothes all the time, uh, that I was very, very clean. The, the opposite was actually true. If she'd asked my mom, my mom would have told her I slept with a German shepherd. I never washed my sheets unless she made me. I was a funk dog that smelled like dog and cigarettes most of the time. So she discovered that only after she moved in with me. So that was scary. Uh, <laughs> See, I was a uh, disorganized slob. Diana was very neat and organized. In our senior year, we were engaged to be married our senior year in high school. And uh, I'm incredibly ADHD, not as much now as I used to be. But when I was in high school, I would actually forget sometimes where my locker was. And if I could find my locker, I would forget my locker combinations. So a lot of times I couldn't get into my locker. And when I did get into my locker, normally there was nothing in it because I'd lost all my books, pencils, papers, and pens by the second day of school. So that was my life. That's the way I lived, and my entire family lived that way. Uh, so it was a pretty scary group. Uh, I grew up surrounded by constant noisy chaos. My family yelled, screamed, we hollered, we were noisy all the time. Diana grew up with strict boundaries and a silence that rivaled a monastery. I remember dating her and pulling up in the gravel driveway outside of her house, and her mother always took a nap on Sunday afternoon after church. And I just rolled into the driveway and closed my car door. Her mother came running out to tell me that the blinds had not been uh, rolled up yet, and it was not time to visit, and I just destroyed her nap. That's how she was about silence. But, and most importantly for our marriage, I grew up in a home where conflict resolution involved screaming and throwing things. She grew up in a home where conflict was non-existent because she wasn't allowed to have an opinion at all. In fact, if Diana raised her voice at all, her mother would slap her and then use days of silence to demonstrate to her that her behavior was unacceptable. This presented a massive challenge in our very first month of marriage. I yelled and she cried. As soon as I yelled at her, she'd cry. And I'd say, why are you crying? And she'd say, I'm afraid you're going to hit me. I said, baby, I ain't ever hit nobody that didn't hit me first. And I said, I'm certainly not hitting a woman. But I said, here, you're messing this thing up. You don't know how to fight. Let me teach you the worst sentence I ever uttered in my entire marriage. Let me teach you how to argue. 
And I did. I taught her so well. I've never won an argument since. I can't I win really arguments anymore. <laughs> it's horrible. But I told her, I said, you know, when I said that, you should have said that. That was totally bogus what I said. That was baloney. You should have called me out on that. And when I yell at you, you need to yell back. You don't need to lay down there like a doormat. Let me know what you think. Man, she is a quick learner. Quick learner. So for us, step one in resolving conflict required us to know, accept, and adjust to our differences. Amen? Step two, resolving conflict requires defeating selfishness. Amen. All of our differences are magnified in marriage because they feed what is undoubtedly the biggest source of our conflict, our selfish, sinful nature. Maintaining harmony in marriage has been difficult since Adam and Eve. Two people beginning their marriage together and trying to go their own selfish, separate ways can never hope to experience the oneness of marriage as God intended. The prophet Isaiah portrayed the problem accurately more than 2,500 years ago when he described basic human selfishness like this. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray each of us has turned to his own way. We are all, we are all self-centered. We all instinctively look out for number one, and this leads directly to conflict. Marriage offers a tremendous opportunity to do something about selfishness. We have seen the Bible's plan work in our lives, and we're still seeing it work daily. We have not changed each other. God has changed both of us. Amen. And I want to insert here, there have been many times in our marriage where Bob and I have come into conflict and we've hit an impasse, you know, the code word lawnmower. But sometimes, seriously, it's, it's been a, a serious situation. And I have had to go to God and say, God, if I am wrong, show me and help me to change. But God, if Bob is wrong, show him and help him to change. And let me say this. This is the key. I have trusted since Bob and I became Christians, I have trusted that Bob hears God. And many times, many, many times, I don't, it's hard to count, that I will pray that prayer and Bob will come back and he'll say, you know what? I think I might have been wrong. Or I will come back and say, you know what? I wasn't understanding. I think I might have been wrong. But it's because we allowed God to speak to both of us, to change both of us. The answer for ending selfishness is found in Jesus and his teachings. He showed us that instead of wanting to be first, we must be willing to be last. Instead of wanting to be served, we must serve. Instead of trying to save our lives, we must lose them. We must love our neighbors, and this includes our spouses, as much as we love ourselves. And I can tell you, I love this man more today than I did 43 years ago when I married him. I know that seems so strange with everything we've been through, but I do. It's through the things that we've been through, through the trials trying to hold on to each other to get through things has caused me to love and appreciate him more today than the day that I married him. So if we want to defeat selfishness, we must give up, give in, and give off. Philippians 2, 1 through 8 tells us, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, and intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God 
a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You know, I want to uh, say at this time, I just, you know, God was talking to me even while she was speaking. Life is a journey. Your, your relationships are part of that journey. Uh, if you were in, uh, in the old days, 1600s, 1700s, and you got on those old wooden sailing ships and you took off to see a far country, which is basically what you do when you get married. You're taking off to locate to find a far country. Uh, we're, we're getting deep into that. We're getting close to that far country right now. We've been at it for 43 years. We've known each other for 45. Uh, but when you started your journey, and I always look at going somewhere as an adventure. I love to travel. I love to go places. I, lo I, I just love life. I have fun. But on that journey, sometimes you knock a hole in the boat or the sails become tattered or the wind stops blowing or you run out of food. And that's the time where the closeness of your relationship becomes deeply, deeply important. To experience oneness, you have to give up your will for the will of another. Uh, that's been very difficult for me. The first 10 years of our marriage, it was ne nearly impossible for me. I told my wife just yesterday, I said this. I said, you know, my goal has never been to hurt you. I I've always wanted to love you and take care of you and protect you and watch over you. But because of my flesh, because of uh, the desires of my heart to do the wrong thing, because of the insecurities in my life, because of the way I was raised, I hurt her frequently over the years. Now, I never lifted a hand to her. She'll tell you that. But verbally, emotionally, I hurt her. I injured her. And it's not that I wanted to. And, and one of the things I say flippantly sometimes is I get up every morning and there's two people I want to please, Jesus and my wife, and I don't please either one of them two to three times a week. There's no perfection in my life. I want you to know that. Uh, I'm a man of strong passions and strong will, uh, and that's a, I have a strong flesh that I have to crucify every day in order to maintain the relationship that I have with her and the relationship I have with God. So we have to give up our own will to Christ, and then you'll find it possible to give up your will to that of your spouse. You must recognize the fact that as much as I love her, I love God more. And I remember the day when I gave her a choice back before I was following God. I said, you've got a choice to make. It's either me or Jesus. And she looked at me and she said, Bob, I love you more than anything else in the world except Jesus. Now you have a choice to make. See, I, I never had any intention of leaving her. I never had any intention of hurting her. But I continually did it because I was in my flesh. See, there's two levels of relationship. The lowest level, the level that 50% of all American marriages never achieve, never attain to is just living with somebody, learning to put up with some idiot who squeezes the toothpaste in the middle. And, and she left me the first year we were married. On our anniversary, I went to work. I was working a second job. I came back. The, house, the car was gone. The bank account had been cleared out. All the credit cards were gone. All the furniture was gone. Everything was gone. And when I finally tracked her down in Oklahoma, which took me a while, by the way, when I finally tracked her down in Oklahoma, I said, baby, why'd you leave me? And this is what she said, Bob, I love you. I just don't like you very much. And I said, well, look, I'll change. What, what do I need to do to change? And she rolled out a scroll with 100 things on it. She said, it's what you need to change. And I said, well, she said, well, what? And here's the sweet part of her, because she's actually a really nice person. And she said, what do I need to change? And I said, baby, you don't need to change a thing. You're perfect. Now, I'm not. that's not true, okay? But she's pretty close. She's as close as I've ever gotten to, all right? The highest level of relationship is learning to live for each other. That is the level that all Christians should aspire to in all of their relationships. For example, I got in the Army in 1980, and then I got out of the Army in 1986, and both times I did not share with my wife what I was doing. I went to the MEP station, took the physical, raised my hand, joined the Army, swore, signed on the dotted line, and I came home in 1980, and I told my wife, hey, baby, we're in the Army now. I thought she'd be thrilled to death. I want to tell you she was less than thrilled. Well, you have to understand, I had never left Wichita Falls. She'd never been out of the state of Texas, so here, Texas. here she is, and we're about to be globetrotters. I'd been a globetrotter my whole life because my dad was in the military for 26 years, so it was nothing to me, but it was everything to her. And, and, but l listen, she embraced the life. She began to love the life, and she didn't want to leave the life. But in 1986, I fell into depression over my father's death, and I got out of the Army. 
and I didn't tell her I was getting out of the Army. I came home. We were in El Paso, Texas, in Fort Bliss, and I said, baby, I just got out of the Army today. We're going home. And she started to cry, just like she did in 1980 when I joined the Army. And she said, why? why? And I said, I I'm tired of the Army. I don't want to be here anymore. And she said, well, can we go anywhere but Wichita Falls, Texas? And I said, nope, I'm going home to Mama. And that's where I went. So you might possibly see how that upstream decision-making process that I have would wreak havoc on Diana's downstream plans. It definitely did, and it definitely created conflict. Step three, resolving conflict requires pursuing the other person. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The longer I live, the more I realize how difficult those words are for many couples. Actually, in this day and age, I realize it's hard for a lot of people to pursue peace, to be at peace. Living peaceably means pursuing peace. It means taking the initiative to resolve a difficult conflict rather than waiting for the other person to take the step. And with if you know me and we are in conflict, I will come to you and I will say, what's wrong? What has happened? What is between us? I don't go to everybody else. I'll go straight to that person and I'll say, what's wrong? What, what can I do to fix this? And it's not to be a doormat, but it's to open that conversation because a lot of people don't know how to open that conversation. But I will go and I'll say, what happened? Why are we at odds right now? Okay? So to pursue the re resolution of a conflict means setting aside, this is hard, your own hurt, anger, and bitterness. It means not losing heart. And my challenge to you is to keep your relationships current. In other words, resolve that you will remain in solid fellowship daily with your spouse as well as your children, parents, co-workers, and friends. Don't allow Satan to gain a victory by isolating you from someone you care about. Conflict will do that, and isolation is always, always, always the plan of the enemy. In my relationship with Bob, when we come into conflict, and I think I've been wronged in some way, I can determine to set my will and fight it out. And I will tell you, I have a very strong will. Yeah. God has had to work on me for years. I am extremely stubborn. And when I dig my heels in, there is no moving me. So I have had to allow God to work on me. But I can set my will and fight it out. I can give him the silent treatment which drives him crazy. Yes. I can keep the argument going and probably win. Or I can set aside my feelings and pursue peace. Here's the thing. Bob usually knows when he's wrong. Most of the time. But frequently, Bob has trouble throwing it into reverse. So for me, to pursue peace with him... I offer him an olive branch or a way to come back from the brink or from that argument. He usually wants to, but he has a really hard time backing up. So what I do is I usually pray and I say, God, help me to open that door. Show me what to do. And so if I open that door, Bob will usually walk right through it and then peace will be reestablished in our home and in our relationship. Because I want peace. Uh, I'm a, a, a highly emotional person. I also, uh, I love to talk, as many of you figured out a long time ago. When I come to, back home from my day of work, I want to download. I want to tell uh, Diana about all my experiences of the day. I talk to her all the time. So if she's angry with me, and uh, I can silence you out, when I get angry, I will just shut up. But I can only do that for a short period of time. There's, there's a limit on how long I can keep my mouth shut, I promise you. So she knows this, and this is, this is what she has. She understands, even though she's really stubborn, and she can, listen, we can get an argument. She can go three, four, five days without talking. That's no problem for her at all. It's a huge issue for me. So I will actually, at some point in there, even if I know I'm right, I will go back to her, and I will apologize so that we can talk again. 
and she knows that's the truth. The problem with that is if I feel like I'm still right, then that argument's going to pop up again in the next couple of days. So she knows that she has to back up a little bit as well and give me that open door. She's got to do that, okay? So step four, resolving conflict requires loving confrontation. You're always going to have confrontation, but the confrontation we're looking for between us and God and between us and our spouse and between us and our boss is a loving confrontation. The poet Wordsworth once said this, he who has a good friend needs no mirror. I want you, it needs no mirror. I want you to hear that again. He who has a good friend needs no mirror because my wife is my best friend. She always has been. I, I don't have a lot of friends I, because I'm a, to be honest with you, I'm a terrible friend. I, I'm probably one of the worst friends you'll ever have because if you're, if you're not right in front of me, I'm not thinking about you normally uh, because I'm incredibly ADHD. I, I mean, I'm, I can focus on one thing at a time. And so, but if I see you, it's like all old friends, well met, let's go have lunch, let's talk, let's have a great time. But if you're not within my, my purview, I'm not paying any attention, I'm not thinking about you. I'm really not. When somebody asks me, well, you know, what's on your mind? Usually nothing. You know, just nothing. I, I download. Once I stop running, I'm off. I just turn it off and I'm gone, okay? So we have to understand that. So uh, he who has a good friend needs no mirror. Dinah is my mirror. She's the one that tells me when I'm wrong. Very few people can do that, by the way. Because uh, I'm also an incredibly, for most people don't know it, highly insecure individual. And when you criticize me, I don't take it well normally. So the only person that can really criticize me where it goes down deep is my wife. I remember one time I was at First Assembly, and uh, I was preaching on a Sunday morning. And it was in the wintertime, and I, somebody had bought me a new sweater for Christmas, and it was too big. Uh, and I got up on stage, and the longer I stayed under the hot lights of stage, the bigger the sweater got. It got full of sweat, and again, it started moving down toward my knees. And it just kept getting, it looked like I added a mini skirt on by the time it was over. And then I, I got the brilliant idea because I used, <laughs> honestly, truthfully, I used to think that I should have a singing career. Uh, so I actually started singing directly in the microphone on stage. And uh, we went to lunch after the service, and I asked my wife, I said, How'd I do? And she said, Bob, two things. She said, throw that sweater away. Don't ever wear it again. And she said, number two, never, ever, ever sing directly into a microphone again. All right. Now, I might not take that from you. I might get angry, hit you out of the head. But for her, I knew she was being honest, and she was giving me her honest opinion because she loves me. And that's the key. When I know somebody loves me and cares about me, then I can take that criticism. Anybody else, you better give it to me easy. Amen. My boss knows that. <laughs> He knows that. He who has a good friend needs no mirror. Blessed is the marriage where both spouses feel the other is a good friend who will listen, understand, has your best interest at heart, and is willing to work through any problem or conflict. And that is this woman right here. To do this well takes loving confrontation. See, you can't just avoid confrontation. My brother-in-law, uh, in his first marriage, what he would do, he would get so angry, him and his wife would argue over finances, he would walk out the door. And in the middle of the argument, just leave. And then when he came back, the conversation was now over. There was no discussing it any longer. That is not fair confrontation. You go out, you calm down, you come back, you sit down, and you talk about what the issue you were dealing with. If you get upset again, go ahead and walk out the door, come back, sit down, and deal with it. Not dealing with it is not dealing with it, okay? You've got to, <laughs> there's got to be a confrontation. You've got to deal with it. So, so confronting your spouse with grace and tactfulness requires wisdom, patience, and humility. And here are a few other tips we found useful. Check your motivation. Will your words help or hurt? Will bring this up cause healing, wholeness, and oneness? Or will it cause further isolation? Check your attitude. Check your attitude. Loving confrontation says, I care about you. Okay, Every, your spouse or your, your uh, uh, significant other needs to know that you care about them. That's the most important thing for me with my wife. Does she care about me? Is the person speaking into my life interested in, in helping me or hurting me? You know, in my program, I tell my guys all the time, I constantly tell them this. I'm here to get you to your promised land. Nothing I do or say is designed to harm you. Everything I do and say is designed to get you to the best place, the best person you can possibly be. I want to know how you feel. Don't hop on your bulldozer and run your spouse down. Something I'm really good at, by the way. 
approach your spouse lovingly. I want to say in that, I have told him before, stop bullying me. <laughs> I don't do that. Next, check the circumstances. This includes timing, location, and setting. Bob and I made a deal when we first got married. We would not argue or fight in public. We would not cause a scene. Because for me, respect is everything. And I always told him, I respect you. I won't argue with you in public. And he always said, I respect you. I won't do it. So there have been times, and you'll see it if you're ever around us. Man, our eyes are sparking. You can tell. It, it says, I'm going to kill you when I get home kind of thing. But we're not going to cause a scene in public. Don't confront your spouse, for example, when he's tired from a hard day's work or her or in the middle of settling a squabble between the children. My kids will tell you there were fights that they never knew about because we'd wait till they went to bed, and sometimes we went out in the yard and yelled at each other because we just didn't want to fight in front of the kids. Now that they're adults, things have come up, and they'll say, <laughs> oh, we yeah, never we knew did. you fought over that. And we went, oh, yeah. One of our biggest fights was over Bethany forgetting to take towels from the washer to the dryer. That was a huge blowout. Because she is me. She's ADHD. She put the towels in the washer. And I come back three days later. Bethany, we're out of towels. <gasps> oh, oh, uh, they're still in the washer. She never even started them. Then she started them three days later. Bethany, what about the towels? <gasps> oh, I never got them out of the washer. Now she's got to wash them again. Three days later, Bethany, we have any towels? Oh, I forgot to put them in the dryer. It's like, stop. But what he didn't realize, <laughs> he does the same thing. Yes, I do. He does the very same thing. But that was a huge, huge argument. And she never knew it happened. The kids that were living with us, my son, they never knew it happened. But it was, it was one blowout. And let, let me tell, tell you, you why they never knew about a lot of this stuff. Because one of the things I found out early on in our marriage is that I could attack her personally. I could verbally assault her. And, and, and uh, listen, I never cussed at her. Never. Ne she'll tell you, never did. But I, I could be pretty nasty with my mouth. Uh, when Jared, my son, was born, when he was six months old. No, he was about a year. Yeah, about a year old. He was in the kitchen. I came home from work one day. We were in Schweinfurt, Germany. I came home from work, and he was in the kitchen uh, with her. She was cooking, and all the pots and pans were on the floor, and he had sp spoons, and he was stirring and making a racket, banging on the pots and pans. with him and being be a with kid. me. Uh, but at that time, like I said, I was very selfish, very immature. I came in, and I said, look. I wanted her to have the house spotless all the time. And I said, you need to get all these pots and pans up, and he needs to go play in his room. And she looked at me, and she said, no, you need to go play in your room. So I found out very early on in the marriage, there's a lot of things I could attack, but the children was not one of them. The children would, uh, attacking the children automatically resulted in uh, me getting a beat down. There, there just wasn't going there. So I knew early on, don't mess with the kids. That's that. And you still don't mess with my kids. <laughs> now you don't mess with my kids or my grandbabies. All right. Next is check to see what other pressures may be present. Be sensitive to where your spouse is coming from. Watch the context of your spouse's life right now. What's going on? If there's things going on in their life, if, if the, 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 they lost a job or you just moved, changed houses or the, uh, they got a new boss at work or the kids are going through something or there's been a death in the family, some other problem that's going on, realize that the argument that you're having is probably not, not about what you're having the argument about. It's really not that important. It's something else that is driving that. And many times we'll talk to each other and she'll ask me, she said, Bob, what's really wrong? Because most of the time, I don't really care about a lot of stuff. But sometimes I'll get on my high horse, and she'll say, what's really the matter? Let's sit down and talk. What's really bothering you today? And when we do that, then we can get through that confrontation, and we can keep the discussion over what we're discussing versus something else entirely. Listen to your spouse. Seek to understand his or her view and ask questions to clarify viewpoints. Absolutely. Be sure you're ready to take it as well as dish it out. <laughs> this is a good one. You, listen, uh, you may start to give your spouse some friendly advice and soon learn that you are saying what you're saying is not really her problem, but your problem. I can tell you, last Sunday, we were on our way to church. We were having a glorious day. We'd had a glorious weekend. We're driving down uh, Loop 11 on the way to church, and uh, uh, she was kidding around with me, and she said something that got into my feelings. I mean, and she, I, I thought, 
oh, no, you didn't say that to me. <laughs> and so I started getting ugly real fast, and I said two or three things, and then I stopped because she said, she looked at me, and she said, do you really want to go there? Which is, do you want to fight all weekend? Is that what you want? Because I'm not laying down because what you just said, that was bogus, and we're going to, we're going to war right here, right now. And I, say, I looked at her, and I said, you know, baby, that went left really quick. I said, I'm sorry. Can we rewind that and just start over? She said, yes, and we came to church happy, which is, by the way, something that I strive for because if we have an argument before church, you're never going to have any doubt in your mind that she's angry because she sits on the front row like this. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I actually had a pastor one time. We, were, we always sat on the front row. And we got in an argument before we went to church. Now, I can come in. I can be all smiling and happy. And if you don't know me, you won't know I'm angry. The way you know if I'm angry and smiling is I'll kick my chin up. That's when you know I'm angry. I can smile, chew gum, laugh, sing, and be madder than a hornet, okay? You're not going to be able to tell unless you know me. You know when she's angry. We sat on the front row, and the pastor was so discomfited during his sermon. He came by after service. He said, what is wrong with, what did I say? What did I do? Why are you so angry? And Dinah said, well, we're not angry with you. We just had a fight before we came to church. He said, don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> During the discussion, stick to one issue at a time. Don't bring up several. Don't save up a series of complaints and let your spouse have them all at once. You should deal with your issues as they arise. And Amen. I had to learn this. Elephant memory is a marriage meme. And Bob put that in there, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, it's you. Because when I got mad, I could remember everything that he did to annoy me. Ancient history. And All it would it. just come rolling out. And so God had to deal with me and say, Diana, one issue at a time. And then God had to tell me, Diana, he can't read your mind. Amen. If you're upset, tell him. No man can read a woman's mind. It's a mystery. Let me tell you, baby. <laughs> Stay on point when you argue. Focus on the problem rather than the person. For example, you need a budget and your spouse is something of a spendthrift. Work through the plans for finances and make the lack of a budget the enemy, not your spouse. If your spouse is, yeah, listen, this is what my wife discovered early on. She went to, when we, she got born again and spirit filled, everything in our household changed because I still wasn't there yet. She began to deal with me through God. And what she would do is she would say, okay, God, I'm going to pray about this. Instead of fighting, instead of going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I'm going to start praying about this because it's the things that drive him, the spiritual forces that are driving him. See, the weapons of your warfare are, are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. She began to see that her enemy was not me, that it was the devil who was driving me, and she began to deal with that, and that nearly drove me crazy. Focus on behavior rather than character. This is the you message versus the I message. You can assassinate your spouse's character and stab him right to the heart with you messages like, you're always late. You don't care about me at all. You don't care about anyone but yourself. Whereas the I message would say, I feel frustrated when you don't let me know you'll be late. Or I would appreciate it if you would call so we can make other plans. Amen. Amen. Focus on the fact rather than judging motives. If your spouse forgets to make an important phone call, deal, listen, we, we got into this argument. I order medication from Walmart. I'm an old geezer, uh, and I order medication from Walmart. Well, I always had my wife do it. Uh, I, I love to be waited on. I love to be served. Uh, I don't, don't, do, don't do my finances. I don't know how to operate the television. I don't uh, program my own telephone. I don't know how much money I have in my bank. Uh, if I, in fact, if I use the little green card from the bank, she'll call me within five minutes and say, what are you doing? <laughs> stay, out of the, stay out of the bank account. So, and the reason for that, whatever you, you will not take respon uh, responsibility for, then you lose control of, right? So I don't want, I don't, those things bore me to tears. I'm not interested if she ever passes away. I'm not watching TV using my telephone or spending any money, okay? So the key is, the key is you have to know, focus on the facts. Take care of business, all right? Don't do the wrong things. Above all, focus on understanding your spouse rather than on who is winning or losing because it doesn't matter. When your spouse confronts you, listen carefully to what is said and what isn't said. 
For example, it may be that he or she is upset about something that happened at work and you're getting nothing more than the brunt of that pressure. Yeah, I want to go back to point one. I got lost in my story. I called, I always had her call Walmart for my medication. One day I got angry because she forgot to call him. And I started yelling at her and she said, she said, let me ask you something. She said, why am I ordering your medication? At the time, I was working for High Plains Health Providers. I was ordering medication for 18 people. I was ordering everybody else's medication, but I wouldn't order mine. And she said, you need to order your own medication. Well, guess what? I order my med own medication now. So if you can do it yourself, and you need to do it. Don't get mad because somebody else didn't do the right thing. Finally, step five, resolving conflict requires forgiveness. No matter how hard two people try to love and please each other, they will fail. You, listen, no matter how hard you try, you're going to fail. With failure comes hurt, and the only ultimate relief for hurt is the soothing salve of forgiveness. The key to maintaining an open, intimate, and happy marriage is to ask for and grant forgiveness quickly. Don't lose sleep over it. Listen, I, I told you the story of her asking me at 9.30 at night when I was in bed in my pajamas at this emergency about going get dishwashing detergent. I did not tell him it was an emergency. Is it an emergency? Well, I wouldn't have gone if I hadn't thought it was. I promise you. See, we got to have Lord. dishwashing detergent. Before tomorrow, the grandkids are here. We have to have the dishes washed. Uh, yeah. I'm a guy. We can leave those things in three or four days, right? No problem. <clears throat> so eventually, I got up out of bed. I went to Walmart because I'm not letting her go to Walmart after dark. I go to Walmart. I pick up the dishwashing detergent. I slam it on the counter. I said, here's your detergent. And she said, very sweetly, thank you very much. And then she went to bed, and I went to bed. She went to sleep. I stayed up all night because I was angry. Right? She could sleep right through it. Not me. So forgive. Forgive quickly. Don't get involved in that so you can get a good night's sleep. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Forgiving means giving up resentment and the desire to punish. And I'm one I hold a grudge, and I tend to be very resentful. And again, God had to work on me for that to say, Donna, give it up. It's over. It's done. Because I tended to want my pound of flesh, and I want it now. And so I wanted to make you pay. But then God told me, he said, Donna, revenge is mine, not yours. And so I had to learn to give that up, and I had to learn to forgive. And you do it by an act of your will. You let that person off the hook. And as a Christian, it's what God commands us to do. He tells us, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Finally, step six, which is our final step for the, today. Resolving conflict requires returning a blessing for an insult. Returning a blessing for an insult, that's difficult. It's really painful for me to do that. 1 Peter 3, 8, 9 says this, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Every marriage operates on either the insult for insult or the blessing for insult relationship. Husbands and wives can become extremely proficient at trading insults. Yes, they can. About the way he looks, the way she cooks, or the way he drives. And the way she cleans house, many couples don't seem to know any other way to relate to each other. Uh, we need to learn to relate differently and understand this. If you're married to your spouse, you know what hurts them more than anyone else in the world. Don't go there. Don't go there. If you know that, they're going to share things with you that they're not going to share with anybody else. Don't use that as a cudgel to beat them over the head with. Don't use it. Don't leave, take that. Leave it out of your argument. It's not worthy of the discussion. And if you, if you throw that, shoot that arrow into their heart, in many cases, you'll never get it back out again. In 1 Peter, it says, For the one who desires life to love and seek good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. To give a blessing first means stepping aside or simply refusing to retaliate if your spouse gets angry. And there's many times Bob will say to me, you're handling me, aren't you? Because there's just days I'm like, this is not worth it. Now, let me tell you how she handles me. What she does is I'll get angry. I'll say or do something that's retarded. And, and she, what she'll do is, is she just gets really quiet. And she answers yes or no to all my questions. And she's just very silent. And I'll look at her because I've learned. 
I'll look at her and I say, you're handling me, aren't you? And she'll say, yes, I am. When you stop acting like a child, I'll stop treating you like one. I do not say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, means changing your natural tendency to lash out, to fight back, or to tell your spouse off is just about as easy as changing the course of the Mississippi River. You can't do it without God's help, without yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit. But it means being do, doing good as well. And sometimes doing good simply takes a few words spoken gently and kindly, or pat, perhaps just even touching them. You know, there's times now if I see he's upset or something's happened, I'll just come up and I'll just hug him, you know, and I'll say, you okay, everything all right? And sometimes it's all it takes. It might mean making a special effort to please your spouse by performing some kind of special act of kindness. Amen. Relationships are never easy. God gave us marriage as an example of the relationship that he desires to have with each and every one of us. Marriage is our template for the relationship model that God wants with us. Okay? He wants to use our earthly relationships as a template for the way we approach him. Many people have long-running conflicts with God. They believe that God has hurt them, wounded them, or abandoned them in some way. And they store bitterness or resentment from some perceived slight or need that they feel has not been met by God. These six steps that we've shared with you today helped us to understand each other, grow with each other, and learn to not merely live with each other, but to live for each other. Our conflicts, our battles, our broken dishes were all steps that led to the repair of our broken lives. This is what God is seeking for his people. I want to add an addendum here. If you're called to the ministry, in the beginning of our ministry, and even sometimes now, the enemy will stir up trouble right before you go out to minister. Can I say something? When Pastor John asked us to do this, I will tell you, I was excited because it's our first time to do this together, and we know we're called to do this. But I will also tell you, I was very wary of this. Yes. And I will tell you, we did not get into conflict. We did not, but we were both very, very careful this weekend not to get into conflict because in the past, when we were youth pastors, I remember one time we were uh, asked together to come minister to church, and uh, we got into a ferocious argument right before the, the uh, served about an hour and a half before we were supposed to be there, and uh, we're supposed to go to this church on a Sunday morning and minister together. And with we got the youth group. In the, with the youth group, and the whole youth group is going with us, and we got into this argument, and I told her, I said, well, I'm not going, and she said, well, fine. I'm going. I said, if I'm not going, you're not going. And she said, I don't care what you do. I'm going. And I said, well, you're not going. And she said, watch me. She goes out in the driveway. She gets in the car. She opens the door. She sits in the seat. And I'm standing, and I'm not allowing her to close the car door. And she looked at me, and she said, get out of the way. And I said, I'm not moving. You're not going. She said, you can move, or you're going to get run down. And she threw it in reverse and started backing up. I got out of the way. I really did do that. <laughs> uh -huh. We ended up making up about 10 minutes before we went. I went and met her at the church. We, we listen, we, it's probably the worst ministry that church ever saw as we were just barely recovering from that argument. We had another argument. We were Wait, going to, The oh. youth group did great, though. The youth group did fantastic. <laughs> we had another. We were doing an outreach. We had these big tents we were setting up. It was the middle of summer. We were about to go set up these tents. We get into a ferocious argument. She's in a truck with one of the volunteers. I'm in a truck with my son. He's 11 years old at the time, right? We're going down the highway. We've had this ferocious argument. We're about to go minister. And my son, just as we pull into church, he says, Dad, we need to pray. And I say, you pray. I'm not praying. See, this is what goes on behind the scenes, folks. She's in a truck with the other ministry volunteer, and that ministry volunteer is telling now, 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 Miss Di, you, you know that you love Bob, and, and we need to pray for him. And she said, you pray for him. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> so there it is. These experiences and many more taught us to pray over any ministry endeavor beforehand and to be aware of the wiles and plans of the enemy who seeks nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy. Why have we talked about this today? Because relationships in your marriage are super important. Because if your marriage is falling apart, it's difficult to do the things God's called you to do. If your relationships with your boss are falling apart, it's difficult to go to work. If your relationships with your children are falling apart, it's difficult to get through the day without being sad. Uh, so the key here is the most important thing is our relationship with God. And so all these things are practice for learning how to deal with Jesus. Learning how to deal with Jesus. Can I have some music, please? We're going to do this real quick. We're not going to take long, but here's what I want to I do. 
if you have uh, at this point in your life, if you're in the middle of a relationship that, that you're having a difficult time and you're saying, man, I just don't know how we're going to deal with this. I don't know how we're, how we're going to handle this. Uh, and I need some help from God. Uh, you heard what we had to say today. Listen, I'm telling you, we've been in the ministry a long time. I don't care if you're in the ministry, you know Jesus, you pray every day and you read your word. You're still going to have conflict. Conflict is everywhere. You have to, it's learning how to deal with it and learning how to put down your flesh. If you're having trouble in conflict today, if that's one of the issues you have, please understand we're here to pray with you this morning. If you're having conflict and issue with God, if you say, me and God just aren't getting along, I don't know why he's treating me this way. I don't know why he's left me. I don't know why he's forsaken or abandoned me. Uh, I trust me on this. He hasn't. It's just how we feel. Now, if that's you, we're going to pray for you today. And if you just want help learning how to deal with relationships, we're here to pray with you today. So I'm going to release everyone in just a second. We're going to pray. And then after we release, if you want us to pray for you, we'll be up here to pray for you. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for everybody in this room today. Thank you for this church, Lord, that, uh, that allows the word of God to be taught freely and clearly. Father, I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is in this place. And, Father, that you rule and reign over our marriages, over our relationships uh, in every way. And, Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you help us to learn to deal with conflict uh, wisely, to be angry and sin not, and to do the things that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You are released. Y'all have a great Sunday. If you need a prayer, Diane and I will be right here.